Hi there, guys. Welcome to Mrs. Chappie's Monuments of Freedom class. This is our second video as we're continuing to soldier on, work through this quarantine. Um, we're going to be talking today about the U.S. Capitol. I'm excited about that um, because I've been thinking a little bit more about your class and how to make sure that you're getting good material out of it when we're not together. And the whole purpose of this class was to reinforce those ideas of freedom that are so fundamental to America. So the first project we did, you know, was a Statue of Liberty because liberty represents that idea of freedom. And so we modeled that out of paper mache. Then we went on and we talked about presidential leaders who preserve those ideas of freedom, um, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, all of our great leaders who were on Mount Rushmore, we built out of clay. And then last week, we talked about the institutions, the um, things created within our constitution that preserve freedom. And we looked at the executive branch in the White House where the president is. And so today I'm gonna continue kind of along on that theme. And we're gonna look at, see I'm screen sharing, look at my, PowerPoint that I have for you here. We're going to look at specifically the Capitol building because the Capitol building kind of goes hand in hand with the White House that goes hand in hand with the Supreme Court. So next week we'll talk about the Supreme Court. All three of those buildings represent our branches of government that we have. So last week we talked to, about this, the White House, where the executive branch is found, where the president lives and the president works, and the executive branch that enforces the laws. Today we'll talk about the one in the middle, the Capitol, which is where laws are made. And then next week we'll talk about the Supreme Court, where laws are interpreted. Um, so I kind of, as I was thinking about it, I'm like, how are we going to do this? What's it going to look like? And I kind of got excited thinking, okay, we can talk about each building. And then when we're together, we can build one of the buildings. I had planned on doing the White House, but maybe we'll do the Capitol since we didn't start it already. So I wanted you guys to just take a look here. I'll throw me over off on the edge. You don't need to see me. Um, to, to reinforce those ideas of how our government is made, how it's divided into three branches so that you have those checks and balances. And each branch has a building in Washington, D.C. that's around Capitol Mall that, and the mall being an area, a big grass open area, not a place that you go shop. When I was little and I heard Capitol Mall, I thought it was like a shopping mall, but it's not. It's more like a giant park that's called the mall. At one end, you have the Capitol building, which is where the legislature is. That's who makes the laws. There's two parts of it. There's uh, wings on each side. One has the Senate and one has the House of Representatives. Again, last week we spent a lot of time on the executive branch, learning about the bowling alley and the florist and all the things there, and then the judicial branch where our laws are interpreted. So when we look at the White House, the White House has two sides. And I remember asking someone once, probably when I was there on a tour, I said, which is the front? Which is, and, and, that's kind of like a tricky question because often you think of the front as being where the where the road comes in front of it. Um, and sometimes you think of the front as being all the fronts of the building face the mall, the where the grass is in the back. So what they do on the capitals, they refer to it as the uh, let's see, what do they refer to it as? Let me think for a second. The the um, east side and the west side. Um, so it depends on where you're looking at it. So actually I was wrong, totally wrong there. It's the uh, east wing and the west wing are on each side of it there on the, you can't see me pointing at the screen, the sides here are the east and the west. The, the this side is the, um, the north and the south side of the building. Sorry about that. And so this is the other, this is the opposite side. So this is the, I call it the front because this is where 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is. There's a road out here that you could walk along that cars used to drive along. Now that's kind of blocked off right in front of it after 9-11. Um, 
you can't get as close to it as you used to. There's a whole driveway that goes through here behind these bushes. There's actually a driveway that goes up to that, the front of the White House, and there's a door there that you can walk in and out of. So I think of this as being the front, although technically you're not supposed to call it that. And then I think of this going into the grass as being the backyard. Um, up here we have the, the residence for the president. So the White House. And the same thing happens with the US Capitol. This, again, being um, one side of it facing west, this is the west side, and the east side is on the other side. We have a statue, and the statue at the top, she's called Freedom, go figure, Monuments of Freedom. She's facing east to watch the rising sun come up. Um, if you ever see the president get sworn into office where they take their oath and do all that kind of stuff, that happens back here facing the, the west in the back of the building. And this would be the front of the building where we have our two chambers of Congress, the House and the Senate are on each side there. And this you can only drive up here if you're like the president and his motor motorcade comes up and stops there and the president gets out and goes in that front door. Otherwise, um, visitors go in, you can see them over here on the sides, they go underground. And so this whole area here is a giant, oops, I clicked ahead, is a giant museum, um, the Capitol Museum, where visitors come, they enter here, and then this is where they learn about the Capitol, they get in their tours, they get everything, and then they walk underground and can come up and you can actually go in this, these parts of the Capitol. Uh, but the main street is kind of about out here. So the public doesn't come up here onto, onto here. Um, sometimes they can, it depends on what it is and what's going on and how, how locked down it is if the president's about to show up or, or what's going on, but the public goes in to this underground area there. I put this picture here because you can see all of these cars in the background. This would be how people arrive. If you're, if you're maybe a congressman coming from the airport or if you're part of the presidential motorcade, you're in one of these spiffy little government cars. This is my kiddo. I have to show, show him in there. He spent um, several months, a whole summer, living and working in Washington, D.C. He worked in the Capitol. This is his congressman. It's probably your congressman, too, if you live in El Dorado Hills or Pollock Pines or any of this area. His name's Tom McClintock. He's your um, representative for this area, and that's who my son worked for in the Capitol. One of his jobs, John Lewis, my son, when he was back in Washington, D.C., was to take visitors who came to see the um, congressman to take them on tours of the Capitol. So he had all these fun facts about it. I said, hey, will you come do a video for my students and tell them about all these little things? And he's like, promptly said, no. What are you going to do? He's practically almost still a teenager. But I wanted to uh, show you some historic pictures of the Capitol, which I think are kind of cool. This shows um, kind of some early illustrations of what the Capitol could have looked like. Uh, the Capitol was designed based on a competition. Thomas Jefferson had this idea and he said, okay, we're gonna give $500 to whoever comes up with the best idea. And um, ultimately a guy named William Thornton came up with this, or it's a little different than this, but a design that was similar to that, that both Thomas Jefferson and George Washington really, really liked. And so it was selected. It changed a little bit over time. We'll talk in a minute about how it was burned in the War of 1812, just like the White House was burned. You can see it today. Now I showed you that illustration of this here, way back here, you can see kind of it goes down here is where the visitors would go and you'd go underground to all this area here. But the reason I'm showing you this picture is I want you to see these buildings here. These and this building here, you can kind of see part of it. This is where your legislature 
legislators actually have their office building or their offices. So if you're a senator or a congressman and you're a member of the legislature, you don't have your office actually in the Capitol building. It's across the street here. And to make it easy for them to get from their buildings here, which are kind of complex, because see how they're weird shapes? So when you're walking around them, you're like, where am I? How do I go? Which floor do I go on? You can see how tall it is, five stories tall. Um, this one's six. And it goes underground. So they're super complex to get around. If you ever go to Washington, D.C., the public can totally go into these buildings. You have to go through security and give them your backpack and everything. But you can go into those buildings and walk right up to your representative's office. You can go to your senator's office or you can go to your congressman's office or congresswoman's office and knock on the door and say, hi, I'm here. If you tell them you're coming ahead of time, they'll put out a sign in front of their office that says, welcome Chappie family or welcome whoever you are. And you can go do that. I know Jay, you did that. Jay went last summer to Washington, D.C., went to see his congressman and ran into my son actually in his office. So I got a picture of that. I thought that was pretty cool. So I wanted you to know that the, the legislators, the people who make your laws, don't work in this building. They work over in those other buildings. Now, underground, to get from the one building to the Capitol, they have their own private subway system and this whole series of tunnels. Now, before 9-11, if you went to Washington, D.C., the public was welcome to walk around in those tunnels. You could go from the office building over to the Capitol, and you could go underground, and they have cafeterias, all kinds of stuff in that. After 9-11, it was closed to the public, and the general public cannot go into those tunnels unless you are escorted by a staff member. So like when I was in DC, I was with my son and he worked there. So he had a special badge and then I got a special sticker and then I was able to go in the tunnels. Um, in the tunnels, they have this subway that staffers like my son could go on unless they're calling the members of Congress to back to the Capitol building for a vote. And then only the congressional members are supposed to be on this little subway thing. To me, I think it looks like Disneyland, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, according to my kiddo, it's no faster to take this than it is to walk. The only difference is, is when you're on this, you, you go straight and you don't stop. Whereas if you're walking, you run into people, people ask you questions, you see people, Sometimes there'll be media people down there trying to interview the legislators and so on and so forth. Uh, so I wanted you to see its own subway. The next thing I wanted to show you historically, this is a painting of George Washington. George Washington, after he and Thomas Jefferson chose the winner of that contest to design the Capitol, George Washington himself actually laid the cornerstone for the Capitol building, which was a huge ceremony. Now, I don't know if you guys can notice, you see in this painting, you have all these guys with these little aprons on. That meant that you were a member of a special, it's called a fraternal order, but it's kind of like a club. And they are called Masons. And Masons trace back historically to the Middle Ages. And these were people that were involved in building things, masonry, right? Masons are people that lay bricks and blocks and stuff. And their little group, almost like a union or a club, or the word for it is fraternal order because they're, it's, it's like a brotherhood of people who build things. Um, they trace their roots back to the Middle Ages and it's based on the people who built Solomon's Temple. It's a biblical um, temple that's in the Bible built by um, King Solomon, who was D David's son in the Bible, in the story of the Bible. Um, so anyways, this shows that all of the people that were attending, as well as George Washington, were members of this fraternal order or this club of Masons which makes sense because he was building the building, putting in the first cornerstone there. Cornerstones are symbolic. They're important because it's supposed to be the foundation upon here, the foundation upon which everything else gets built.
around. So we have him laying the cornerstone. When they designed that Capitol building, there was this great plan to bury George Washington in a crypt underneath um, the Capitol building. Of course, everything you know probably about George Washington sounds like that's something that he would not be all about. And you're correct. His family said, no, we're not going to allow him to be built there. He's not going to be treated and revered like, you know, some sort of God or something special like that. We want George Washington to be buried um, where he chose. And so before he died, he picked out a very special place at his home. It's called Mount Vernon. It's in Virginia, not very far from the Capitol. And this is actually George Washington in there, you can see in his crypt in Mount Vernon. So this is where George Washington ended up, not in the Capitol, although that was the intention. Um, on the top of the Capitol building, there is, I mentioned this a moment ago, this huge statue. It's called um, Freedom is the name of it. And it weighs, I looked this up so I could tell you, 15,000 pounds. It is nine and a half feet tall. It was restored back in 1993. They took a helicopter and they took it down and uh, brought, her, brought her off. She's facing east, um, the side of the Capitol where the visitors walk in. And... Uh, looking towards the rising sun, kind of the rising beginning of our nation. She has all kinds of things going on. If you look carefully at her, she has the sword, but yet it's um, put in its cover, which prepared, finished, but not active, has this sign of victory, this laurel wreath. If I have some of my students who are much better on your Greek and Roman mythology than me, but that's definitely um, from the Roman Empire that victors would wear. She has a brooch right there putting her um, kind of like, uh, what do you call it, toga dress together and it has U.S. for United States on it. She has some Native American um, influence on her with this kind of like, um, what are you gonna call it? Blanket kind of hanging over her. What I really like is she's standing on this pedestal that has um, a globe. And on that globe is some Latin. Okay, my daughter, she's a classical civilizations major and majors and can speak Latin. But the Latin on there, she gets really excited when she sees Latin like this says um, E Pluribus Unum, and that's the motto of the United States. It's on our, on our currency, it's on our bills, it's on um, a lot of different things. If you look at coins, you'll see it. It says E Pluribus Unum. That means out of the many, there is one. And that's talking about out of the many um, colonies that we started as, the many states, the mi many like multiple, not many like small. Um, the many states, see I'm mispronouncing words, the many states um, came together to be one union. So out of the many, there is one. And so that's pretty cool. I think that it's on that, on the top of the Capitol there, we can see that motto, out of the many, there are one. Um, just as the White House was burned in the War of 1812, kind of the second revolutionary war between the United States and Britain. So was the Capitol building. And this is a illustration after the fire um, in 1814, the War of 1812, when the British came through Washington, DC and burned all kinds of stuff. You can see the Capitol was smaller at the time. Um, but at this time in history, the Library of Congress was contained within the Capitol building. Today, if you go to Washington, D.C., the Library of Congress is immediately across the street. And what the Library of Congress is, was originally a collection of all this great information that senators and congressmen could use when deciding what laws to pass and deciding what information. And it was kind of like there was no internet. So all the information was gathered into one collection and it was kept in the Capitol so that they could all have access to it and everything. And it got burned up. So that was kind of a serious, huge bum bummer for the United States. But not to worry, 
there was a guy, Thomas Jefferson, you've heard of him. Thomas Jefferson was an avid collector of books. He read everything. He had books on agriculture. He had books on architecture. He had books on philosophy. He had books written in other languages. Um, he decided he was going to speak, I think it was Spanish. Don't quote me, I could be wrong. And the best way to learn it was to read Don Quixote in Spanish. So he did that. So Thomas Jefferson had this a mass, mass library. Thomas Jefferson also got himself in serious debt. He was a farmer. He wasn't when I say farmer, it's not like he was out there digging himself. He had a huge plantation that was run by enslaved labor, um, but he was agrarian based on agriculture, and he had gone into debt. So he says to the United States government, hey, guys, you lost your whole library. I'll sell you all my books. Don't quote me again. I feel like it was for around $5,000. I could be off on that. And Thomas Jefferson made a deal with the United States government to sell a huge chunk of his library to start a new Library of Congress, which is now across the street. If you ever go to Washington, D.C., you can see Thomas Jefferson's original books that were donated. They're kind of displayed separately because it's the foundation of our current Library of Congress. So that's pretty cool. Um, this is one of my favorite things that I wanted to make sure I showed you about the U.S. Capitol. It's the rotunda. And if you have been in, in any of my U.S. history classes, you've heard, you've seen this all before. I'm going to actually link below a separate link for you to be able to watch. I was going to embed it, but I found when I play videos inside of my video, they don't work as well. So I'm going to put the link below. But in this rotunda, are all these huge, huge, massive, massive paintings. And I love these paintings. Let's make me small. I don't really, you don't really need to see me there. I love these paintings because these paintings tell the story of the United States. If you start, you can start with DeSoto discovering uh, the new different lands, but then you can go around and come to this one here, which is the Mayflower and the pilgrims coming over to Plymouth. You have all kinds of cool um, symbolism in it that we talk about in our U.S. history class from rainbows to Bibles to praying to warriors to all different kind of things. If you've taken U.S. history, you know the first permanent British settlement that was successful and didn't vanish was Jamestown and that there was a lot of interaction with Native Americans, and you've learned about John Smith and John Rolfe, and this is John Rolfe's wife, um, known most commonly as Pocahontas. This is actually when she had changed her name to Rebecca, and this is the baptism of Pocahontas at Jamestown. You continue marching through U.S. history, and you come to this super important thing in, in our timeline of our independence, and we have the Declaration of Independence here. So you've got um, Benjamin Franklin, you've got John Adams, you've got Thomas Jefferson, you've got all these guys presenting this document that says we want our independence from the British. Within the Capitol, so um, um, make sure you watch that video just because it's super cool. At least I think it is. Within the Capitol, you can also visit the old Senate room. And if you're in my US history class right now, I just did a video talking about the beating of Senator Summers by Senator Brooks. And they were gotten their, they were all upset and arguing a lot about slavery and what to do with new states. And they busted out into a full on fight where, um, Senator Brooks beat Senator Summers with a cane. And this is the chamber that that took place in. This is the old Senate chamber. If you go to the Capitol, this is now just a museum. It's not used. You can walk in this door. You can walk up here, look around and walk out. And his desk is one of these back here. There's a book sitting on it where you can actually see it. But this is what the original Senate chamber looked like. And you have a gallery where people can sit up at the top. And this is the modern Senate chamber. This is what it looks like. So there's 100 desks because there are 100 senators. 
the bad picture you can't see at the top there's a gallery you can go in and visit it now to go into the capitol anybody can um go in and go on a public tour if you talk to your congressman or your senator you can get a private tour uh, but you saw where you went in but to be able to go into congress you need to have this can you see can i get that oh there we go you need to have a special pass that will get you into the gallery and to get this pass you have to go to your actual representative's office and you have to say okay i'd like to see and this pass actually this one gets you into the house of representatives the senate one is red you can get that too from your senator and that will let you into um watch what's going on on the floor there to get in you can't take your purse you can't take a camera you have to go through like i don't know at least two maybe more security screenings it's like an ordeal so i just showed you this is a picture of the senate this is a picture of the house of representatives if you've ever seen the state of the union and i grabbed this picture because i wanted you to see this gallery up here so you can actually see where the public would be in the state of the union all of the members of the house of representatives the senate the supreme court the joint chiefs um all show up in the president talks you should kind of recognize the picture of george washington over there so that you have it, my friends. This gives you a little bit overview of what the Capitol building is like, what it looks like, what it's for. I'm going to link some cool videos below for you to look at, um, but I wanted to give you just a little bit more information about one of the buildings that houses the people that protect our freedom, that make the laws that keep America free. So the whole purpose, again, of this class was to focus in on monuments of freedom and what we have around our country that represent that idea of freedom so the white house and the capitol i think are excellent excellent buildings um, that deal with that i look forward to being with you where we can actually build those uh, out of mrs chappie's famous foam board and some hot glue so have a great week i will see you guys uh next week or you'll see me anyways take care bye guys